of the Monitoring Golf Moisture Return with GOES Imagery Session. I'm Dan Bikus, myself and uh, Jeff Braun will be leading this particular recording here. And this was put together as a, a short, hard-hitting session here so that you can complete it within about 30 minutes or so and, and just deal with this topic here. And although primarily we talk about golf moisture return, it can be applied to moisture return in, in general as well, and we'll show some examples of that later. Our objectives are to identify and track low-level moisture utilizing GOES imagery with other data sets uh, during various situations. First of all, at nighttime using the 10.7 channel as well as the fog product. And then uh, during the daytime using the higher resolution visible imagery. And you can also still use the 10.7 imagery as well. And we'll also look at cloudy versus clear conditions. Uh, when to use it when it's cloudy or clear, and we'll show some examples of that as well. First, let's consider the response curves, and what we're looking at here is a plot of the pressure versus the weight. And what what, what this really means is let's look at the um, water vapor channel right here, the 6.7 channel, and we can see that this peaks around 500 millibars, so that means we're looking at the mid-levels of the atmosphere primarily. Contrast that with the 3.7 or 3.9 and 10.7 channels here, and you can see those peak near the surface. So those would actually be detecting low-level moisture uh, most readily. Those two channels. So that's what we're going to be concerned about most. Those two channels. Now let's consider using the 10.7 channel at night under clear skies. And the thing we really need to look for is sufficient thermal contrast. The moist air mass here will appear warmer or darker in the standard IR curve, and the dry air mass will appear cooler or lighter in the standard IR curve. Here's our example. This happens to be an old example from uh, 13 May 1985, but it's the... Um, 11.2 micron uh, channel back then, it still looks pretty much the same as the 10.7 channel. And the signature that we look for here is the moisture advecting towards the north, which you can see uh, quite readily where I drew it in, where we have this uh, darker region, remember that this would be warmer brightness temperatures advecting towards the northwest, indicating that moisture moving towards the northwest. Let me erase those lines and focus in right here on Midland, Texas, and you can see the moisture actually passes through there where they have dew points go from 19 to uh, low 60s. And next I'm going to show soundings that uh, indicate that passage of the moisture uh, across Midland, Texas there. Here's the soundings from Midland. First of all, this is at 60, just before the moisture makes it through the region. And then we go to 12Z, and you can see the moisture has made it through. And the real use of the satellite imagery here is that you can use the surface observations for a course idea in terms of the location of the moisture boundary, but overlay that with the 10.7 channel to give you a more precise idea in terms of the location of the moisture. And then you can use the sounding here to give you an idea about the magnitude of the moisture here. In this case, it's about... Uh, 80 millibars in depth. Now let's look at um, cloudy skies. We're still at night and here sometimes we have insufficient thermal contrast and the solution is to use the fog product. The thing to be careful of here is that you have to make sure that the um, moist air mass is indeed uh, co-located with the low-level clouds and in the warm sector, and the way we'll do that is to look at the surface odds and overlay that. Here's the 10.7 micron channel, and there's actually moisture return occurring here, but because the thermal contrast is so uh, low here, it's very, very subtle. You can actually barely see it, the, the warmer temperatures advecting towards the north here associated with the low-level clouds, but very subtle. So now let's look at the fog product and see how this shows up. With the fog product, this shows up a whole lot uh, more readily. In this particular enhancement, the high-level clouds are darker or black here. These are the uh, some thunderstorm cloud tops uh, in northern Alabama and Mississippi. And then the low cloud tops, or 
the, the lower uh, cloud tops are in the lighter colors, the white colors. So we have this low-level stratus advecting towards the north. And remember what I said to do here in terms of verifying that this is indeed associated with the warm sector, low-level moisture in the warm sector. So we overlay the METARs here and we can see that indeed we have 60 dew points associated with that uh, region advecting towards the north and further support here in southern Alabama where the dew points go up by several degrees with the passage of this. So again, uh, use the surface OBS here to give you a general idea of the moisture return and overlay that with the satellite imagery to tell you precisely where that moisture boundary is. Now let's go to the daytime and here we have the advantage of using the visible imagery because of its higher resolution, but we can also still use the 10.7 uh, channel as well if there's sufficient thermal contrast. The thing to note here is that this is opposite of the nighttime appearance. Here the moist air mass appears cooler or lighter in the standard uh, IR curve, and the dry air mass appears warmer or darker in the standard IR curve. Here's our example from 22 May 2004 looking at the visible imagery and the first thing to note is a dry line from the eastern Texas panhandle extending up into Kansas here with dew points around 70 just east of it and dew points in the 20s just west of that dry line. Now we switch to the 10.7 channel and we can see that over here in the moist air mass it appears cooler or lighter in this enhancement and then west of it west of it where it's uh, drier you can see it appears warmer so what we have going on here is the opposite of what's occurring at, at night in other words the dry air mass during the day is warming up faster than the moist air mass uh, to the east over here now let's look at a visible loop where we actually have some clouds to help indicate where that low level moisture boundary is and I call your attention here to South Central Kansas, and you can see low-level cloud streets oriented to the low, uh, oriented parallel to the low-level flow here, and that happens to be associated with the low-level moisture advecting rapidly towards the northwest, and we can see this uh, taking the form of a warm front right across here in Central Kansas, and thunderstorms actually initiate uh, close to the end of this day, um, and the low-level moisture return was playing a key role here. We can see this in the IR channel as well, and um, let me just stop the loop here and go to a particular time, and you can see it, uh, it's more subtle, but the low-level cloud streets do show up right here, and again, the, the boundaries here between the uh, moist and dry air mass does show up as well, so we, we can use this uh, at night as well if we have some clouds indicating where that low-level moisture is. So here's really the best way to analyze the moisture. We have the surface observations giving you an idea of the magnitude of the, the moisture, but also a coarse idea of the location of the moist air mass. Overlaying that with the satellite imagery gives you a very precise uh, indicator of the location of the uh, moisture here. You can see the boundary here, the warm front, very well. And then you can also overlay the model dew points as well to give you an idea of how well the model is, is doing. This particular case is a 12-hour forecast overlaid with um, this time here near 0Z. Zero Z, and it gives you an idea of how the, the model was doing in terms of the moisture return. During the second portion of this uh, exercise here, the session, we'll be looking at a couple of cases that uh, uh, help support what Dan was talking about before in identifying the low uh, level moisture boundaries uh, from the dry boundaries and just identifying boundaries in general and using this to especially uh, f help fine tune now cash short term forecast get a real uh, hone in very well on uh, uh, the changing local storm environment uh, whether it's going to help the storm increase or decrease or whatever and we'll be looking at these uh, through uh, uh, through these animations. Let me go ahead and start this loop here and uh, what we notice on this day which happens to be May 6, 2003 um, this was right in the middle of an extended period of severe weather over the Central Plains that uh, very much affected uh, Missouri, Oklahoma and uh, Kansas 
uh, many, many tornadoes in Missouri over this uh, over the seven-day period that this lasted. On this particular morning, uh, I'm going to go ahead and stop this uh, animation right here, and you can see uh, moisture advecting right here. We've got a tongue of moisture, and uh, we'll move this forward, and you can see how that's moving up towards these storms that have been ongoing overnight in western Kansas, moving into central portions of Kansas. Uh, they're elevated at this time. Uh, marginally severe. Uh, hail sizes running right around uh, three quarters of an inch to one inch at most uh, during this time. But as this boundary moves up and interacts with this storm, uh, right in this area, you can see how the storm starts to change uh, external characteristics. And we've talked about uh, in some other sessions about uh, these storm characteristics, uh, overshooting tops, uh, like right here, uh, extremely crisp uh, back portion of the anvil. Um, we're starting to see areas of uh, inflow feeder clouds here, uh, well-developed flanking line, and also indications of uh, invigorated RFD coming off the backside of this all this time. And as a matter of fact, as this low-level moisture boundary, which is now sneaking up right in here, interacted with this storm, a storm, I can't say for sure, became surface-based, but it was nearly so. It uh, enhanced the storm characteristics, intensified the storm, and uh, hail sizes immediately uh, shot up to uh, two and a quarter inches over this period of time, and many funnel clouds were also noticed with it. Um, I'm going to go ahead and just overlay some of these uh, METARs, and I'll run this back, and you can kind of follow the progression um, of the moisture. There's the moisture tongue as it moves forward and through these areas and watch uh, moisture values. Dew points go from mid 50s up to the mid or upper 60s in some cases as it, as it moves through. Um, something that we don't show here is the sounding from Springfield as the same moisture boundary went through. Uh, showed up very well that we had about uh, a 50 millibar depth of moisture. Dew points ahead of the moisture boundary were running right in the 9 to 10 degrees centigrade range. After the passage went through, we were running at about uh, between 18 and 20 uh, degrees centigrade. This slowly increased again through the day, and we ended up, um, by the end of the day, having about 100 millibar depth of moisture and dew points sitting right around 20. So you can see how this is very important, uh, tracking these kind of boundaries. Uh, low-level moisture boundaries in the warm sector um, and how they affect the local storm environment. Here we changed from an elevated uh, situation of ongoing storms in the morning. We were able to break the uh, cap around it and bring in additional moisture and uh, intensify these storms greatly. Here's an additional image also from May 6, 2003, which takes place about 40 minutes after the last image of the last loop. And we can see that uh, that easternmost storm that we were looking at still looks nice and strong with the crisp backside of the anvil there. Uh, we've also got a strong flanking line showing up with a good area of inflow feeder clouds on the east, to the east side of it and continuing indications of uh, RFD production out to the west side, which is helping reinforce that flanking line. Um, for this particular image, though, what I really want to talk about is the uh, placement of the moisture and what we're doing is we're looking at a combination of a satellite image along with METARs, and we're trying to get a better grasp on exactly where the deeper, uh, stronger moisture is in this particular case, and compare that to the ADA forecast. And what we can see here is the ADA forecast with the dew point contours or isodrosotherms has a pretty good handle on a pretty good trend of where the moisture is, but what I did was I went ahead and drew in the 65 uh, dew point contour in this particular case, and just to show you where it's off a little bit, and then we'll talk about a little bit uh, why that's important. But in this particular case, the uh, ADA, the actual moisture was actually displaced further to the west down here in the southern portions um, of the area, while up here a little bit further to the north, the actual moisture was displaced a little bit further uh, to the east, they had headed further to the west, and even up here on the north side, um, very close, uh, the, the lines actually run fairly parallel to each other, but again, the ADA has a 65 dew point a little bit further to the north when the actual 
uh, moisture is actually a little bit further to the south. So those are things to keep in mind that you can use the combination of the satellite and the OBS together to really fine tune uh, where the boundaries are. And uh, also, you know, using a loop, you can find out where it's coming from, how fast it's, it's advecting, in this case to the north, and interacting uh, with those storms. Is deeper moisture moving into the area or is or is it becoming less? Is drier air moving in from the west? How's that going to affect the storms? Um, but in this particular case, that's what we really want to look at because um, that's what all this is about is identifying the moisture boundaries here and how they're going to interact with the pre-storm environment or, or uh, an environment where there's already ongoing convection as in this particular case and how it's going to modify those particular storms. We'll uh, run through the conclusions of this session uh, that Dan and I have both presented. Um, we want to remember that in clear skies, uh, moist air mass in the 10.7 uh, micron channel, the infrared, it's going to appear cooler, lighter in the daytime, and at night it's going to appear warmer and darker. And we've talked about this before, and it has to do with the differential heating and cooling on either side of the line. Um, the dry air is going to heat up or cool down much faster than the uh, warm air mass, and that provides the uh, sufficient uh, thermal contrast for identifying these boundaries. Um, as for the cloudy sky situation, um, you should use the fog product. That's nothing new to you all, um, but the fog product will very much help identify you know, boundaries, whether it's actually stratiform and you can see it, uh, especially when you're talking about uh, aviation forecasts and stuff or identifying the leading edge of uh, uh, that moist boundary. But also, even if uh, we don't have condensation in clouds at the time, it'll pick out the uh, uh, low-level moisture that's uh, advecting through. And in the daytime, of course, you want to pick the visible imagery, uh, which is, is very high resolution. And as long as you're not covered up uh, overhead with um, high, thick clouds, uh, visible is the way to go during the daytime. And a few more things to remember in this last portion of the co conclusions for this session. Um, we're really doing a moisture analysis here, and we can locate using the satellite and the METARs the area of the moisture. We can fine tune that, of course, with the satellite as it moves between uh, the course uh, METAR stations. Um, and then we, you want to go to the soundings and find out what kind of depth of moisture we're talking about and how it's uh, evolving over time. We can get an idea of what kind of moisture is moving into that area, how deep it is, and whether we'll have a chance to significantly change uh, the pre-storm environment or the ongoing storm environment. Uh, we also want to always, and, and uh, you guys do this very well, uh, compare what we're seeing with the satellite and uh, METAR OBS or surface OBS or, uh, or the upper air soundings, we want to compare all this with the model output to see uh, where the model is doing good, where it's not doing good, and we can fine tune that just like as we saw before, uh, even though it had the trend of where the moisture was coming from, where it was going to, uh, we could fine-tune that uh, by using both the satellite and the surface OBS in, this particular, in that particular case and locate the boundary a lot easier and quicker. And in that case, we could have forecast, or at least near-term forecast, uh, the evolution of the storms that we saw in Kansas going from elevated to surface based or nearly surface-based anyway. Um, we also learned multiple ways to identify different kinds of air boundaries and air mass boundaries from the fronts, the, the cool outflow, the MCSs. Um, we could identify those all from the same principles using the sufficient thermal contrast on either side of the boundary to actually identify the boundary itself. And we also want to be able to uh, analyze the low-level moisture across a wide range of these spatial and temporal scales. And in this particular case, we looked at large areas through the central portions of the country, and we were looking at the synoptic scale, the mesoscale, all the way down to the storm scale. And a little bit of practice here using all these different uh, image channels or combination channels, um, and you can really help yourself out 
gain a better understanding of what's going on. And uh, when you get into a quick warning situation, you can maybe, uh, it might help you to make decisions a little bit faster because you know uh, how the environment is being modified uh, one way or another. So that's it for this particular session.